This University of Montana School of Journalism production was made possible with support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and by the University of Montana. Driving. Driving is an exercise in trust. We trust other drivers will stop when they're supposed to. We trust other drivers will stay in their lane. We trust other drivers are paying attention. Distracted driving to me would be my children playing in the back seat. Doing anything but what you're supposed to, you know, look ahead, watch your surroundings. From cell phones to pets in the vehicle to your own mental state that day. I mean, we all do it. I don't know anybody that doesn't. If you're not looking at the road, you're taking a chance on yourself and everybody else on the road. We associate distracted driving with cell phones, but the problem is much bigger than that. The number one distraction, being lost in thought. Sometimes people will say, you know, what's the most important part of the brain for driving? And really, every part of the brain contributes. In 2011, distracted drivers injured more than 421,000 people and killed more than 3,000. It's a growing problem, and national campaigns have recently launched to raise awareness. Your eyes are on the road, your hands on the wheel, but your brain isn't geared on driving. In this program, one Missoula mom struggles with giving up her distractions when she gets in the car. One Kalispell man pays the price for another driver's distractions. And a Sydney teen educates her peers about the consequences of distracted driving. We'll explore those consequences and what's being done to stop the problem in distracted, eyes off the road. If you're as outraged as I am about distracted driving, we need to start our own movement to stop it. The Department of Transportation is launching a haunting ad campaign next week. Colorado is working to stop distracted driving. Let's go, you guys. Come on, hustle. Jacob, if you're going to take a shower, go take a shower. Let's go. Last time. Come on, B. Missoula mom, Nicole Schreckengust, has a lot on her mind. She has one hour to get four kids to four different schools with little margin for error. If he misses the bus, then our whole process gets screwed up and we are in a rush. Brayden, did you put your pajamas in here and your toothbrush? Nicole's morning is hectic, but it's also repetitive. She's made her kids breakfast five days a week for 36 weeks for the last 11 years. She's repeated this task almost 2,000 times for her family. Here we go. I'm married to Brent. We've been married for 17, 18, I don't know how many, how many years, 18, 19 years. We have four kids. Uh, Lucas is 17. He's a junior in high school. Um, I have Jacob, who is 15, and he is a eighth grader. I have Brayden, who is 12 and is a sixth grader. And I have Brooklyn, who is six. Film. Film. Like most working moms, Nicole juggles several jobs at home. The secretary. That's only that many pages per 15 minutes. The accountant. Do you have lunch money? And the fashion designer of the family. Why are you wearing boots today? Your feet are going to be super duper hot and you need to... I'm always thinking about the next thing. I'm always one step ahead. I'm doing two, three, four things at the same time. I don't know. They're your shoes. Go look. One of the things you have to keep in mind is that there's always a cost. Um, whenever you're multitasking, um, doing two things at once, you do both of them less well than if you were focused on one thing. Mommy, I just have to wear this. Bye, I love you. In Nicole's world, that's a small price to pay. She's already got two kids out the door. I don't think that I can do it better than other people, but I think I'm, I am in nature a multitasker. So I, um, I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to multitask. But 
But Nicole's multitasking doesn't stop when she leaves the house. I'll pick you back to school. Bye. You ready? The driving part of Nicole's routine has become second nature, just like preparing her kids for school. Driving can become like a habit. It's kind of like riding a bike. You just do it. You don't think about balancing. You don't think about the pedaling or the stopping. And driving a car is the same way. You just drive. But in the car, Nicole stays productive. Brooklyn, did you do your homework? Did no. you read your sentences? No. Why don't you get them out and read them to me? But by listening to Brooklyn, Nicole isn't as focused as she thinks she is. Blood flow actually leaves the vision part of your brain and it goes up to the frontal lobe to help you get through all of that. So in the meantime, with less blood supply to the brain, you're not visually paying as much attention as you should. Hey, Mama. Bye -bye. Nicole hasn't been completely focused on any of her tasks, but she's successfully working her way through her hectic morning routine. And her day is just getting started. Have a good day. I'll be there in a little bit. Tomorrow morning, the federal government is launching a major new ad campaign to warn about the dangers of texting while driving. It's a message you have surely heard before. Distracted driving is dangerous. Tom Fitzpatrick of Kalispell has a much calmer morning routine than Nicole. The first drink every morning is a perfect call. Uh, I don't know, just something uh, Oh, he's absolutely a creature of habit. <sighs> he does pretty much the same thing day after day, um, almost hour after hour. Tom owns M&T Auto Body in Kalispell. He opened these doors for business in 1990. Paint them, uh, buff them, sand on them. I work on the frame rack. Yeah, just a little bit of everything. When he's working, he moves. He has stuff to get done. Well, it's just something about working on cars. I like and enjoy it. Tom must pay close attention while sanding the hood of the car, focusing on tiny details in the metal. While much of his work requires that focus, another daily task, like shuffling paper, requires much less brain power. Research shows that the brain creates a condensed list for repetitive tasks we do every day, what neurologists call chunking. But you've got to have those routines down. You know, it's got to be a pretty automatic chunking. The fact that my brain has those routines up and ready to run does save a lot of brain power. So Tom's brain saves power while filing paperwork so he can concentrate fully on his more intricate work with vehicles. I wonder if this is OSHA approved walking around with a razor blade in your mouth? Just like Nicole, Tom takes his routine into the car. The brain chunks tasks in order like a morning routine, but also does this with routes we drive. Today, Tom drives to a local car dealership to drop off a finished car and pick up another one. He's done this exact task while driving this exact route 10 times a week for 15 years. That's 7,350 times. If there's a change in your routine, it forces your brain to to quit running that routine tape and pay attention. Recently, Tom was forced to change his long-standing routine because of an incident with a distracted driver. <clears throat> Drivers who like to keep their pets in their laps are on a seat unrestrained. We are getting confirmation that two have died and three others are hospitalized in a crash. Eastern Montana's flat, wide-open countryside seems like a place with fewer distractions. Long-distance drives on straight, two-lane highways are common, and it's easy for the mind to wander. 
Sydney High School senior Josie Moore is getting ready to speak in front of her entire student body. And even on this special morning, Josie's phone demands her attention. Oh, wait, where is it? I'll shut it off. Adult station. To a certain extent, the, the computer and the cell phone makes us all feel like we should be connected 24-7, that we should always be responsive. The Moore family loves the outdoors. But even when they're in the backcountry, the kids use their electronic devices. It is 8.27, Wednesday morning. About to take off on a hike. They're a tight-knit group, and they don't take themselves too seriously. Josh is the oldest, married with kids. Jennifer, the second oldest. And Josie is the youngest. And Janae, she's the videographer. Dad's gonna go bear hunting. Oh. Oh, there he is, bear hunting. What you doing? Bear hunting. <sighs> Watching the meadow. Waiting for a bear to just walk on through. This is a really special picture to, for us. This was uh, Josh's wedding picture and the girls were all bridesmaids and they took a real nice picture of just the four kids. And I think the joke was on Josie, but uh, it's, it's nice to see them all laughing. The Josie were right in the middle of those high school years, you know, and, but she's a good kid. She doesn't take a lot of discipline. She doesn't take any discipline. She might be a little bit spoiled compared to the rest, but I have a good relationship with her. She's very, very independent. She's real strong, strong-willed, and I, I think that, you know, anything that she puts her mind to, I know she can do. You know, I'm, I'm proud of her for that. Josie's been planning her speech for weeks. I thought I shook all those off. And the big day is finally here. But she's still a teenager, tied to her phone. Our computers and our, and our cell phones ding us whenever something comes in. And there really is sort of an expectation that if I send you a text message, you should be getting back to me pretty quickly on that. When I drive, I, you, I don't touch my phone. I'll have my friend mess with it or, you know, if they want to pick songs, I'll have them do that. And it's the same with my mom. If she's driving and texting or needs to send a text, she'll tell me, you know, hey, send this person this and she'll read it to me and I'll text it out for her. So I definitely focus a lot more on um, watching the road. I'll see you after school. Or actually, I'll see you at lunchtime. Love you. There's a lot of kids that use their phones. Yeah, especially right when we get out for lunch, everyone has their phone out. And that scares me the most, because leaving for lunch, everyone still has their phone out, and they're still driving while texting, so. For some of Josie's peers, ignoring a phone while driving is difficult. More than 70% of teen and young adult drivers have read or sent a text behind the wheel. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, one in four teen drivers do this every time they drive. The teen driver is going to be sorely tempted to pick it up and see what that text says, just for that instant immediate gratification. The adult driver is going to know that even though he hears it, he's driving and he needs to just have the willpower to not answer it, or maybe he's already put it on silence. Josie's learned firsthand why she shouldn't use her phone while driving. Today, she hopes sharing her experience with distracted driving will make her peers consider putting their phones away when they get behind the wheel. I think something serious needs to come up in their eyes that will affect them, will scare them to put their phones down. I am really excited. I'm not nervous about it, even though it's with my student body, I'm not nervous about it. I'm, I'm excited to go out there and tell them the story, so. I expect it to hit home with a lot of the kids. All of the kids mostly are born and raised in Sydney. They know my family. It'll be interesting. It'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, I told Miss Anderson that like I was covering from like the family perspective and you're covering from, you know, highway patrol, what goes on with the system and stuff like that. So Yeah, actually I, I gave her the option, Josie, do you you know, 
do you want us all there? Or, and she said, yeah, sure. So if she'd have wanted us to not be there, then I would have probably hid somewhere. <laughs> and I was going to be at the school one way or the other. But. I'm going to introduce you to my sister, Janae. Surprisingly, the vast majority of car crashes are caused not by driving while intoxicated, but while driving while distracted. Nicole deals with a hands-free ordinance every time she drives in Missoula. Tom and Kalispell and Josie and Sydney don't face any law restricting cell phones behind the wheel. In 2010, Billings passed Montana's first hands-free cell phone law so a driver can use a cell phone, but can't touch it. Now, 10 cities and two counties have similar bans. Bozeman passed its hands-free law in 2012, and police say they have a tough time enforcing it. Um, there's one right next to us. I'm pretty sure that's probably a cell phone violation. Can I prove it? No, not paying attention to traffic. Um, but that phone is out of view if that's what it is. Officer Tommy Franchoni is on patrol looking for distracted drivers. Makes it very difficult, and to me that's more, almost more distracting to have it down lower like that, trying to, trying to drive with it out of view. And there it is. Now he's spotted the phone, but it's not enough of a priority for Franchoni to aggressively pursue that distracted driver through traffic. Well, I can't get to it now. Montanans see other drivers using cell phones all the time, but the number one distraction is something you can't see. The NHTSA says the number one distraction is being lost in thought, followed by cell phones, things outside the car, passengers, and adjusting vehicle controls. Because distracted driving is difficult to quantify, we conducted our own experiment. We put two cameras in plain view at busy intersections in Missoula and Kalispell. During one hour of the morning commute, we counted every distracted driver we could see. The cameras themselves drew some attention, and we saw people modify their driving behaviors as they drove past. It was difficult for us and the camera to see inside the vehicle, just like it was for Officer Franchoni. In Missoula, we saw 39 people on their phone, 25 distracted by food or drink, and 13 people distracted with smoking. Overall, we saw 87 visibly distracted drivers in that hour. In Kalispell, we counted 87 people on their phones, double the amount we saw in Missoula. Missoula has an ordinance, Kalispell doesn't. Most of the other distractions, like putting on makeup or trying to clean the windshield, we're about the same as in Missoula. We were able to see many examples while drivers stopped at the intersection. But most of these drivers continued their behaviors, such as texting, talking, or eating, while driving away into the intersection. Officer Franchoni thinks Bozeman's ordinance has made a difference. I think cell phone use has declined a little bit within the city limits of Bozeman. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? Good. I'm Officer Franchoni, Bozeman Police Department. Stopping you for use or possession of a cell phone while you're driving. Officer Franchoni aims to educate drivers about the law and the dangers of distracted uh, driving. And, uh, go ahead and stay in the vehicle and I'll be right back up with you, okay? okay? You know, we don't have any way of tracking to see if he's been stopped before at this point. So I don't know whether he's been stopped for cell phone violation before. I'm going to use this as an education opportunity, educate him a little bit, and hopefully he does the right thing next time. Now if we stop him again, hopefully we can, at least I can remember who he is and, and hopefully address it with a citation at that point. So I'm going to get him out of here with a warning and we'll go from there. In the first four months of 2014, Bozeman police issued 40 tickets for cell phone use while driving. So when, I guess, where did you get stopped for the cell phone? That's about 30% of the total number of people they pulled over for it. Here in Bozeman? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right, so you're, you're definitely aware of it. Um, yeah, I knew, okay. but I didn't know. I mean, you know, it's one of those things with the, with the speaker thing and all that stuff. Okay. I just wasn't sure on the rules. 
Okay. All right. Um, now, definitely, for sure, uh, the next time you get stopped for a cell phone, you're going to be cited for it. Um, oh, yeah. Just some education on it. It is a $100 civil penalty they, for it. They cited me the first They cited you for the first time? Okay. Um, I, I'm being nice today. Um, you know, I'm, I, you know, if someone doesn't understand it, I like to make sure that you understand. Stay off the cell phone or you'll be cited again. So that's my recommendation to you. Okay? Thanks. All right. Have a better day. Drive safe, okay? See you. All right. Nine people are killed and more than a thousand people are injured in crashes that involve distracted drivers. It's not illegal for Nicole to use her phone when she first leaves her home in the county, but when she hits Missoula city limits, only hands-free devices are allowed. Nicole drives around 40 miles a day, ferrying her kids, going to work, and running errands. She still uses her phone in the car, but she has her limits. I have been known to text at stop signs, stop lights, right there. Um, that kind of thing but I don't text when I drive. I, that to me is different than talking on a phone. I don't, I don't have to use my hands. I don't have to turn and look away. It's just a matter of pressing a couple buttons and I'm good to go. Okay, Jake, watch when you cross the street here, please. Nicole takes some precautions, Love but a, a study day. by the National Safety Council I'll shows run. even pressing a few buttons triples her risk of an accident. I'll call you later. Bye. Another study by AAA shows hands-free devices that use Bluetooth technology are just as distracting as actually holding the phone. If you're having a conversation with someone in the car, again, you know, your brain kind of intuitively knows that if it doesn't understand something, that, that source is right there and you can go back and repeat it. But whether it's hands-free or, oh, okay. or holding a cell phone, your brain will automatically pay attention to that auditory conversation well, on the phone knowing that you can't really get it back. Everyone we spoke with had some experience with distracted driving. Yeah, I remember when I was in high school uh, I was driving my dad's pickup and back then we had like cassettes and I, my cassette had dropped and all I was doing is I was reaching down for the cassette and I bounced off a car and that could have been somebody on a sidewalk. I've been fiddling with my phone and hit the rumble strips before, you know. I've never run off the road or anything, but I, I can, you don't have to be a genius to see that it's a, it's a distraction. Brain expert Becca Robertson faces distractions in her car. For her, it's national public radio. I know I've been guilty of listening to something on the radio and kind of going on to autopilot. So my automatic systems have taken over and I've been driving and yeah maybe I got to my destination safely but if something unexpected had happened um, my attention was diverted by the conversation that I was listening to on the radio. Um, which incorporates quite a bit. Even Officer Franchoni, tasked with enforcing a cell phone ordinance, deals with distractions of his own. If we've got a lot going on in the patrol car we pull over to the side of the road um, a lot of times you'll see officers on the side of the road um, either running, a, running information in the car or trying to get information on a call. Um, you know, obviously we do have scenarios where you can't do that. Um, if you have a high priority call, we can't pull over to the side of the road to look at the information. Um, so the call actually plays a little bit into that as well too. You get a high priority call, um, you, you get, I guess, kind of a tunnel vision into that call. But you got to learn as well, too, to take that tunnel vision out and focus on your surroundings and get there safely. Yeah. Why does Jacob go first every single day? Nicole was pulled over in Missoula for being a distracted driver in the fall of 2012. So, last fall, I was uh, doing an equipment run from Meadow Hill over to Target Range School. And on my way back, I was in a hurry trying to get back to Meadow Hill before practice was over to deliver some equipment. And Tasha called and needed to know if I had two specific items in my car, which in the back seat I had all my football stuff. So as I'm talking to her on the cell phone, and it was legal at the time, I was talking to her on the cell phone, I glanced back in my car and kind of rummaged through my equipment that I had and to look for two specific si sizes. While doing so, I was kind of speeding through possibly a school zone and a police officer pulled me over. And so when he pulled me over, 
Um, he, we had a little conversation about me being on the cell phone and speeding through a school zone, but he did let me off with a warning. When I was going to deliver the equipment to the other group of people, I happened to pass his wife while I was talking on the cell phone again. <laughs> and that is my cell phone. Sorry. Okay, give me a kiss. Love you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. I'll be in a, there in a little while. Nicole says she's aware of the dangers of distracted driving, but doesn't see herself changing. It's life. Life is so busy. And you have to be there at a certain time. And you have to be the next place at a certain time. And go, Brent. Go. Brandon, go. Sorry. Can you say that again? I don't know what was I talking about. Oh, life in general? Yeah, one second. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. Don't be. Okay, life in general is just so busy. You have to be from one place at a, one time to the next place at another time. And nobody cares that, what your schedule is or how many children you have or what you have to accomplish in that day. Um, and if you can't accomplish it all, as a parent, if you feel like you've failed or someone makes you feel like you're not doing your job. It's hard, it is so hard. And I look at uh, after school and say, I only have my children from this time to this time, and I have to cram all these things in, in there, and nobody cares how you do it. So I can't see myself ever until my children are out of the house, not multitasking. Back in Kalispell, Tom Fitzpatrick is downing his third cup of coffee, getting ready for his work day. He will definitely push himself beyond his limits. He does it all the time. I still do my daily routine, even in pain, so. But his routine has a major addition. Tom was hit by a distracted driver at one of Kalispell's busiest intersections in May 2013. Because of his injuries, he's added stretches for his neck and back to his routine. When I first get up in the morning, I'm stiff, stiff in my, uh, Back definitely hurts, so. Yeah, it just, it happened so quick, it just sort of caught me off guard, and I wasn't sure really if I'd been in an accident because I'd whacked my head pretty good, and then once I looked around, seen both of us were spun the opposite way that uh, I knew I'd been in one. The gal texting came right through the red light, and I had the green to go through. The girl didn't even slow down an ounce. She come right through. Nailed me, and that's when the, a guy and his wife were standing on the corner, waiting to walk across. And I had the windows down; it was nice. And I heard him walk right over to her and say, "You were texting." And I sat there for a minute, and then I got out of the car and I walked over to her to see if she was okay. And she said she was, and she was still texting. She never quit from the time we collided until. Probably three or four minutes she was on still texting, so. I'm, I'm lucky it pinched some nerves in my back and screwed up my neck and stuff, but uh, I'll live with it, I guess. I got the pinched nerves working good. My neck will probably never come around 100%, but uh, I can at least work. Tom was limited at work for seven months, and his doctor ordered him into physical therapy for eight months. And he had a frustrating time dealing with the other driver's insurance company. They accommodated me pretty good for the first two or three months. And then come in September, they said, oh, I think you got to be good by now. You don't need any therapy. And I still couldn't hardly get out of bed and stuff. You know, I was still coming to work every day, but I was hurting. And I still hurt to this day, so. Tom wasn't at fault for his accident, but he still had to deal with the physical, emotional, and financial consequences. He spent a good deal of time with insurance agents, physical therapists, and repairing his totaled car. All new lights, fog lights, both headlights were out, the grill was out, the bumper was out, but there was like 9,000 damage on it. One of those type of guys, you know, work 
hurt or not, I, I still come to work, you know, where some guy's got a little runny nose, they take a week off type deal. I'm not, I've never been like that. I, I work. You know, I don't think he's at 100% right now. So, you know, I don't think he'll ever be at 100% post-accident. So I think um, this is just one of those, you know, setbacks that he can probably count on for the rest of his life. If, if she hadn't have been texting it, it probably wouldn't have happened. She'd have seen the light coming up red. She would have stopped. I'd have went on my way. Nothing would have, I would presume, would have happened at all. I don't know. Sometimes you do feel a little immune. You know, you maybe can feel like you're super safe because your driving habits are, you know, good. But that doesn't mean just because yours are the uh, other people on the road aren't. So it's just something to think about and just be aware when you're driving a car that it maybe it's maybe it's not you causing the accident, but that somebody else can. San Diego County Sheriff's Department is cracking down on anyone texting and driving. Back in Sydney. Josie Moore is getting ready to do something out of her routine. She's going to talk to her peers at Sydney High School about how distracted driving impacted her life. I'm going to introduce you to my sister, Janae. July 10th, my sister was killed in a single vehicle accident in a rollover. and. She was distracted driving. She was driving distracted. And what I want to talk about is the effect it's had on our family. Janae just, uh, she was infectious, I think, with her, her spirit and her, her uh, happiness and her quirkiness. And, you know, she just, people wanted to be around her. She was like a light. So, sitting in the pickup, waiting for my mom. She went inside to get my thank yous because they're still not done. And my dad's sitting over there. Oh, there he is. Um, the people coming today are, oh, it's about 11.54. Just got this sweet new swimsuit. It's a one piece. Yeah, it's badass. Janae graduated from Sydney High School in 2011. She enrolled at Dickinson State University across the border in North Dakota, where she majored in political science and played basketball. She, she was over the top extreme. She loved the game. Um, she, would, she would physically play till she almost like couldn't breathe. Janae made the 142 mile drive from Dickinson to Sydney as often as she could. Janae, Janae liked to text and drive. She thought she had a system. Um, she would always put her phone right up next to the steering wheel and then she could still see the road. I remember her, she'd, she'd brag about it. And she would say, I've got a system, I've got a system. And Janae, I caught her texting and riding with me a, just a couple months before she was gone. And I said, Janae, stop that. And she said, Dad, I can handle it, she said. I can still hear her saying it, and in her, she's just so confident. And she did quit text, and she finished what she was doing and put it up. But that was her attitude. That, and she was a safe kid. She, she, you know, if you went for a ride with her, she'd make you put her seat, put your seatbelt on. I mean, she was safety conscious, and she wasn't a crazy driver or anything. And she thought she could handle it. On that July morning, Janae was driving on a highway outside Sydney to her summer job at the lake. It was a road she drove nearly every summer morning. And so she's basically sideways, passenger side first into the ditch here, and you can see her tires start grabbing in here. Skin in the earth here. I think we figured it rolled at least one complete time cleared this fence and just landed right out in there. And then Janae was on the other side, obviously in the driver's seat. She was hanging from the vehicle by her seatbelt. Passersby cut the seatbelts, got her down and they checked for signs of life and she was gone. You know, she did good in everything she tried to accomplish. And I think 
that she just had that attitude that I could do it. You know, who can't text and drive? And I can remember vividly the, the car tearing through the ditch and I went, what in the world is that car doing in the ditch? And then I went, oh no, it's family. So we drove down into the ditch and the pickup had so much momentum that it was across a fence. She hadn't hit the fence, she went over it. Um, we pulled up, she stopped, and I got out of the car, and I screamed, that's my sister. So when my dad pulled up, my mom immediately screamed, it's Janae. I don't know if any of you have ever truly heard a heartbreak. But when my dad screamed no, I heard his heartbreak. When I got out of that pickup and walked up there and I heard my wife say that, it's Janae and she's gone and uh, I just hit the ground. I couldn't breathe and stuff. And I don't know. What's the question again? What I want to get across is the fact that Janae was unbelievably smart, unbelievably gifted, and this happened to her. She was distracted driving and isn't here. So what I want to ask is for all of you, in the sake of your parents, in the sake of your friends, and anybody who cares about you, to make the right decision when you get in your vehicle. Set your phone down. Have your friends handle your phone. Because no matter how smart Janae was, she's not here today. And that'll never change. In Janae's case, obeying a cell phone law, had there been one, might have saved her life. A recent report by the National Transportation Safety Board indicates that drivers that are texting are 163 times more likely to get in an accident. A bill proposing a statewide ban was introduced in the Montana Senate in 2013, but it died in committee. Montana and South Carolina are the only two states in the nation without some kind of statewide law restricting cell phone use behind the wheel. Ten cities and two counties have bans, including Silverbow County, Deer Lodge County, Baker, Billings, Haver, Bozeman, Great Falls, Helena, Hamilton, Missoula, Columbia Falls, and Whitefish. Of the major Montana cities, Kalispell remains the only one without a cell phone ordinance. Ordinance 1719 regulates the use of handheld devices while operating a motor vehicle. Kalispell has struggled with passing a law and the latest version came before the City Council in 2012. We're going to stay consistent here tonight. I will not be supporting this ordinance. Council member Phil Jafrida supported a statewide ban and worried about the effectiveness of a patchwork of city laws. So you could be driving through Whitefish, Montana that has a cell phone ordinance and, and have a set of rules and regulations that, that base that ordinance. You can drive two miles and be in the county and have no law. You can drove through Columbia Falls and have another law. You can come to Kalispell, and, and we don't have a law, but if we did, so we did, and then you'd roll into Evergreen one block away and not have a law. Question, does this put an undue burden? Fellow city councilman Randy Kenyon thinks cities should pass cell phone ordinances because a statewide ban isn't likely. It's just not the nature of our, what I consider to be very conservative legislature. And the fact that they don't have time, and I think they would furthermore say that it's a municipal issue. Let local people decide that. Well, just because Whitefish has done something, or Missoula's done something, or Helen has done something, or wants to do something, doesn't necessarily mean we have to follow. I'd like you to vote against 
banning handheld devices while driving. While lawmakers struggle with the politics of cell phone bans, car manufacturers keep coming up with new technology to keep drivers safer. Be focused. If you are tired, get this bike to change you. Spring Creek Mine in southeast Montana uses a technology that scans drivers' eyes and facial movements. Supervisors can watch from a control room to see if their drivers are paying attention. The system talks to distracted drivers, telling them to pay attention. That technology is not yet available to commercial car manufacturers. A smartphone app called Drive Off automatically locks the screen and blocks calls and texts when the vehicle is traveling faster than 20 miles an hour. You betcha. Uh, the middle sensor right here is for the Distronic Cruise Control. Mercedes car salesman Charlie Pugh says cars are becoming so advanced that human drivers might someday become unnecessary. Um, what I think is, I think these cars are going to start to be able to drive themselves very soon um, because of the number of you know, radars and sensors that they have on these cars. They can park themselves, um, they can pull you back into their lane, they can speed you up and slow you down. I got to go here, there's your heated seat, here's my heated seat, shut that off. And while car makers are focusing on safety, they're also adding all kinds of distractions inside the car. Things like touch screens, GPS, and video players. Where the heat's going, I have to look and, oh, I'll go that one. Ira Hyman says it's where your mind is that matters. And drivers don't realize just how much they miss while their minds are off the road. And it comes down to this really interesting phenomenon called inattentional blindness. You can have something go right in front of you and you fail to notice it. Um, and the interesting thing is when you fail to notice it, you, you don't know that you've missed something and missed something important. When the, the fact of the matter is they're missing all sorts of things, they may be putting themselves at great risk, they may be putting, putting other people at risk because they're unaware that they didn't see something. God, was this morning the death of a popular Hellgate High School senior who was killed when he was hit by a car Monday afternoon. A driver on Missoula's busy Mullen Road didn't see the people she hit. All I can think about is that day and what it was like and how I felt and how scary it was. Gabby Rosier was walking with her boyfriend of five years, Chance Geary. They were strolling hand in hand, walking from a McDonald's. Suddenly, Gabby felt as though she had been pushed. A car drove up on the sidewalk, sending Chance flying more than 30 feet. He landed in the ditch. Gabby was on the ground, stunned, with minor injuries. She says it all happened in a matter of seconds. I told his parents and I told my mom and I called them before, you know, the cops even got there. And so it's like I have so many billion thoughts that run through my head that I can't even straighten them out. And it's like at that point, I can focus on nothing. Chance was rushed to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. The driver was Yuni Cho, an adjunct professor at the University of Montana. According to court records and witness statements, Cho had recently leased a 2013 Acura ILX. When she leased the car, she told the agent she was not a good driver and a little scared of driving. Cho testified that she was trying to adjust her window when she hit them. Cho was charged with misdemeanor careless driving and driving on the sidewalk, another misdemeanor. No jail time and no fine. She declined to talk about the accident, tearing up and saying she has nightmares to this day. According to the NHTSA, in 87% of distracted driving accidents, the cell phone is not the main distraction. Immediately afterwards, I felt like an accident's an accident, and um, I was surprised with myself on how I changed views. I feel like jail time should have been enforced. Gabby still has nightmares about the accident, but she admits that, like so many of her peers, she still uses her phone while driving. I'm a teenager, just like everybody else, so I still make those mistakes, and every once in a while I'll still check my Facebook when I'm at a stoplight, or I'll still throw a text out here and there, or I'll answer my phone if someone's calling, but I try to pull over and I try to slow down and I try to stop if I can, but I know that it could be me that makes that mistake. And it's sad that I've been through something and I still feel like, not necessarily that it's acceptable, but that, you know, I let it slip. Second National Distracted Driving Summit. New government numbers show this is still a deadly problem in America. With thousands of deaths and nearly half a million distracted driving-related injuries each year, raising awareness has become a national trend. 
The National Safety Council declared April 2014 the first ever distracted driving month and released a series of shocking public safety announcements and also a website to promote education and awareness. Recent data from the NHTSA shows these kinds of efforts can reduce the use of cell phones while driving by one third. The Department of Transportation. CBS News featured a month of heavy coverage of distracted driving during April. And AAA published research to educate drivers. Any distraction can pull attention from driving, but texting and driving is the worst. It takes an average of 4.6 seconds to send a text message, and a lot can happen in those few short moments. The car that hit Tom was traveling about 25 miles per hour. At that speed, a car would travel 170 feet in those 4.6 seconds. We did some experimenting with this, too. Using a camera placed above street level and a camera in our target car, we demonstrated just how far a car would travel in the time it takes to send a text. While driving in downtown Missoula, 25 miles per hour, we turned the camera away from the road. Each second, we travel 37 feet. By the end of the 4.6 seconds, we ended up in the middle of the next intersection with the potential for a collision. A year after a texting driver hit Tom, he remains leery of others on the road. I'm a lot more cautious coming into reds and green lights, whether I got the go or not, give it a double take. As far as affecting my life, I don't think it has, except for the first six, eight months going to therapy all the time. But uh, other than that, I'm good to go. Nicole received a warning for distracted driving, but says she hasn't changed her habits much. Would I be willing to leave it at home? I can't say that I would. I don't know what would make me want to leave my cell phone at home. Not that I don't want to. It's just a, there's that need, that feel of like I'm going to miss something or somebody has to get a hold of me or what if something happens with my children. And so I think it would be impossible for me to leave that cell phone behind. Distracted driving has become as much of a problem as drunk driving. Most teenagers find it impossible to leave the phone behind too, but not Josie Moore. Josie hopes sharing her sister Janae's story will affect someone else's behavior behind the wheel. And like I told Josie, we'll never know. You're never going to know that, oh, you talked and this kid, Joey, listened to you and he missed being in a head on because he put his phone. You won't know. It's not something that we're going to get feedback on. Josie, your speech saved my life. You know, it's not like that. It's just something that she can put out there and hopefully as a, as a young person, other young people will listen to her and take it to heart and put their phone away. Janae's parents kept the painful reminder of her death and hopes that hauling the destroyed truck around eastern Montana will make an impact on Montana's youngest drivers. I think there's some kids that think that they're kind of invincible and it won't happen to them, but I, I can happen to anyone. Like, you don't really expect it to, like, happen to someone so close to you, like a friend of yours. And it was just unbelievable that it happened to her. I guess it just, it scares me. I would never text and drive again after that. I've had a lot of students message me on Facebook and text me and stuff like that. So it is really cool. Um, my dad had mentioned that there wasn't going to be a lot of, <laughs> um, a lot of difference right now, he said, but I think in the long run it'll help a lot, so I'm glad about that. She pulled it off. I, she did good. I could never do it. I'd be a blubbering fool. I know I would. I wouldn't have got past the opening lines. So yeah, I am incredibly proud of her for that and trying to bring something good from it all, you know. I'm hoping to go to different schools and kind of, Janae was very well known throughout, you know, Montana kind of, she was known through a lot of Montana, so hopefully to travel to more schools and spread her story. It, it, like I said, if something good could come out of the whole thing, you know, for some other family doesn't have to go through what we go through. I don't think that going and 
dragging that truck to a school, the wreck, and talking to kids for a half hour is, uh, that's pretty cheap. We see distracted driving everywhere. The Centers for Disease Control calls it an epidemic. But we still take that leap of faith, getting behind the wheel and trusting other drivers are paying attention. You know, some people, it, nothing's gonna change them, I would say, but um, I don't know what else to try. And just like what we're doing now, I think I told you already, it's, it's not an easy thing to, to tell you, to tell the world that my daughter was probably texting and it made her, caused her to go off the road and it cost her her life. Laws deal with cell phones, but 87% of the time, a cell phone wasn't the distraction that caused the accident. We can put as many laws out there as we can. Um, doesn't always mean that we're gonna, we're gonna have those cases where people follow it all the time. Um, you know, state law would be, I think, a, a great thing. And I think eventually, um, I think probably almost every state would probably eventually go to it. I think it's a matter of time. Um, and it may end up being eventually a federal mandate. It, uh, you got a fine and it hit your wallet a couple of times, you would probably think twice. So. But we can't pass a law that forces people to pay attention behind the wheel. As a society, we embrace the feeling that being busy makes our lives worthwhile. Sometimes we're too busy and our driving suffers as a result. I don't know that you can always take distraction out of it. I think that unless we slow down as a society and slow down with our daily lives, we're always going to be facing this challenge. It will take a cultural shift to change our habit of distraction, and it's tough to change the brain once routines have set in. So if you want to break that habit, you've actually got to start with the very first step, which is the cue. And, you know, some people will put their cell phones on vibrate, but that in itself, that vibration, can still be a cue. So what you need to do is you need to actually change the whole cue. Um, either if you hear the phone go, pull over and stop. You can still use your phone and get the call if you really feel like it's going to be important, but you're not putting yourself and others at risk. There's not one single solution, and there's no easy fix. The Moors believe sharing the story of Janae's tragic death can make a difference. Being she's deceased, you'd like to brag about her, and, and there's a lot to brag about Janae, but the uh, fact is she was texting. Um, and if, if, if we can talk about it and uh, get some people to think about it, especially young people, and hopefully get somebody to put their phone down, then it, that's worth it as far as, uh, I don't know what's your answer to your question of the, it's worth a shot, I would say, to use the tragedy angle because I don't know how else you get to, through to young people. As long as you have busy lives and busy schedules, um, unless there's like a personal tragedy where you realize you have that sudden of aha moment and it's sad that it takes that, but that might be the, the moment where we all say, you have to slow down. Teen-focused ad campaigns and education efforts are underway, but parents might have the best chance of getting through. You got to pick your battles, and uh, I think that that's a battle I'd pick now to take their phone away. Or you could test check them real easy. Just text them <laughs> if they answer when you know they're driving and uh, there's gotta be repercussions. And that's up to the individual family, what they wanna do. I would say that probably leading by example would probably be the best way uh, and explaining it to them. Is that always easy to do? No. Um, uh, the only thing I can do is talk to them and emphasize it and have consequences to actions. Josie hopes to personally impact people by sharing her family's story. Janae's was the most determined person I've ever known. Her determination, her strive to do better, her strive to affect people in, in good ways is what's really pushing me to want to do assemblies and want to talk to people and tell them, tell them her story. 
I asked God for help right there on my knees in the ditch to just give me strength to get through this for my family. And well, there's nothing harder to understand than losing your daughter. And uh, I miss her, you know, but I believe she's in heaven. I believe she probably doesn't want to be back here. And uh, I believe I'll see her again someday. I can't wait. Maybe I'll chew her butt a little. Thought you said you could handle it. This University of Montana School of Journalism production was made possible with support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and by the University of Montana.